Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Film Daily for August 17th, 2018. On today's episode, we're going to talk about the latest film and TV news and answer a question at the mailbag. Uh, this is Slash Film Editor-in-Chief Peter Soretta, and joining me today's podcast is Managing Editor Jacob Hall. Hello, hello. And writer Chris Evangelista. Hello. Guys, it's been a long time since I've been, at, you know, here on the podcast. I've... Uh, I've been traveling. Last week, I was in Las Vegas at a magic convention. We'll talk about that next week at the water cooler. And uh, I came down uh, with, you know, one of those con colds uh, and uh, have been uh, sick all this week. But I am I'm officially back today uh, and it, it, w- w- with a cool topic in the mailbag. We're going to talk about um, we're going to answer a question about what you should know if you want to attend a film festival as a uh, you know non journalist, um, and we'll we'll give you our our knowledge uh, from from the side of journalism. Um, but first, before we get into that, let's get into a, a couple bits of news. Uh, news has been kind of slow lately. Uh, you know, we're hitting the August period where you know things just slow down to a kind of halt or grind. Um, let's start off talking about a Catwoman movie that could have happened. Starring Michelle Pfeiffer, uh, Chris. Uh, I know Ben wrote this up for the site, but can, what can you tell us about this? Uh, yeah, so John August, who wrote um, Big Fish and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, uh, and you know other things, uh, was at one point um, trying to write a solo Catwoman movie for Michelle Pfeiffer. This was long before they made the solo Catwoman movie with uh, Halle Berry, and. Um, uh, on Twitter, he took to Twitter and he he laid out his his general idea for it. I won't read the tweets because they're they're a bit lengthy, but it boils down to his idea was Catwoman leaves Gotham City, she moves to Chicago, and an accident basically wipes out her memory of being Catwoman, and it's almost like it's kind of like a, a werewolf movie where she still is Catwoman, but she doesn't realize it, so she keeps turning into Catwoman. And, you know, performing crimes, crimes, like performing robberies, and she doesn't realize she's the one doing it. Like, she'll wake up the next day and read in the paper about, you know, Catwoman's on the loose, and she doesn't realize she's the one who actually is Catwoman. And it's it's it's, it's a really neat idea. It's certainly a lot better than the solo <laughs> Catwoman movie we got. So it's a shame this never happened. It does seem like an, a clever idea. It does seem like an idea of a different time. I mean, we got to put this in some context. This was probably be in development sometime after Batman Returns, but, you know, before Chris Nolan took over the Batman franchise. So it was a different time for superhero movies. Um, and, uh, Jacob, do you have any thoughts on, on this, you know, this forgotten, never made Catwoman movie? Uh, my knee-jerk reaction is, what's the fun of taking Catwoman, Michelle Pfeiffer's Catwoman, and not letting her be in control? Because so much of that character is what makes her fun is how deliciously and devilishly in control of herself she is and how she makes her choices and sticks to them. So taking that away from her feels a little odd to me. But at the same time, I think John August is a good writer. Like you said, different time. And you know what? I, I would have been interested to see this because I think it's a shame that Michelle Pfeiffer only played Catwoman once. John August is a great writer. He has a, uh, a podcast that, if you're interested in the world of Hollywood and screenwriting, uh, the Script Notes podcast, you should listen to that. And uh, he he's written some. Uh, I, I know he's largely credited now with these like kind of big like Tim Burton esque movies, but uh, his early career like had films like Go, which uh, is one of my favorite films of all time, actually. So uh, you know he, he's a great writer. Uh, I would I would love to check out this script if it if, if it exists somewhere on some hard drive uh you know you know my email peter at slash uh but anyways let's move on to another bit of news and that is that jason bourne is getting a tv spinoff in the form of a usa network show called treadstone jacob tell us about it yeah, we heard rumblings about this a little while back, but now it's official. USA has ordered Treadstone the series. That means no pilot, no testing. It's going to be a show that we'll be able to watch no matter what. And for those of you who I don't remember, Treadstone is the Black Ops CIA program from the Bourne movies, the one that trained Jason Bourne and molded him to the weapon that he is in those movies before he comes amnesic and has to go on the run. And what's interesting here is that this is going to be a prequel about the essentially evil uh, evil uh, government organization that um, our heroes in those movies fight against. And 
this will be a born less uh, born spinoff because <laughs> there's no born exists to take down Treadstone. It takes place before born, so it's it's a whole weird thing. So I like the idea of a series set in this morally gray CIA world. Uh, I'm not so sure how audiences will react to a born c- series without Jason Bourne because after all. Uh, remember uh, the Bourne Legacy, starring Jeremy Renner, the one Bourne movie that didn't do especially well at the box office. So, uh, I wonder what you guys think. Is, is there appeal for the Bourne world outside of Jason Bourne? Uh, is Treadstone something that you guys want to watch? Because USA is trying to redefine themselves. Uh, they're moving away from the burn notices and the suits more toward uh, Mr. Robot and the Purge. They're trying to become, I think, they're trying to take themselves a little more seriously. Do you think this is the right move? Are you guys going to watch this? <sighs> no, no, I'm not. Uh, Chris, what are your thoughts? <laughs> I really don't. I guess it depends on what direction they're going to go because, you know, the, the Bourne movies make it pretty clear that Treadstone is, for lack of a better word, evil. So, like, is this going to be a show about, like, a really evil, shadowy government organization? Like, that might be interesting because, you know, I feel like a lot of shows and movies, they portray, you know, espionage in this positive light and to see it, you know, in a negative light, like, you know, might be interesting, although, but I don't know how you can sustain that as a series. Like, after a while, you're going to get tired of just watching the bad guys win all the time. So I, I, I guess it really just depends on how they're going to approach it. And I should mention, this is being developed by uh, Tim Kring, the creator of Heroes. Uh, no disrespect toward Mr. Kring. I'm not a Heroes fan. Uh, I'm not a fan of, of, his, of his output so far in television. Uh, but... I don't know. I'm not sure if he's the right fit for this, uh, just in general, because I think that Chris is right. If you're going to make a show about Treadstone, it should be a show about bad people doing bad things. And um, I think the combination of USA and Kring feels like it's going to be essentially 24 all over again, and 24 is already run its course. Yeah, and especially without kind of like these uh, highly dead, deadly super assassin uh, agents like it's just going to be you said it's just going to be a story about Treadstone itself and not um, that whole program am I correct uh, yeah or? I mean the, the details they haven't released like an official plot synopsis I mean presumably we may see some super agents or some Jason Bourne-esque agents but there's no there's no Bourne here there's no no Matt Damon so we're going to see them maybe creating and programming these super soldiers but we're not, it's not going to be what we want out of a Bourne story which is Bourne fighting back so I, I don't know what the story here is and if we're going to judge by the action we saw in Heroes and Heroes Reborn, uh, you know, this is just not something I want in my life. Uh, but you know what? I saw, you know, the pilot for, uh, what, the Jack Ryan TV series. That, uh, is is it coming to Amazon or is it already on Amazon? On 31st. 31st uh, at, at, Com- at Comic-Con. And I was uh, surprised that I might actually watch that. And that no, that's, seems... Am- that's, that's Amazon money. This is USA money. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but I, I don't know. Just the idea of a Jack Ryan TV series is like, it's just, I'm not going to watch that. But um, yeah. Um, let's move on to our third and final bit of news before we get to the mailbag. And that is that the director and producer of The Wanted movie is now developing 14 computer screen movies. Uh, he believes this format might be the future of cinema. Chris, is he nuts? Uh, I don't know if he's nuts. So uh, I'm, I'm, I know I'm going to butcher his name, but it's Timur <laughs> Bekmambatov. That's yeah. probably wrong, but... You see how I cleverly did not mention his name? Yeah, it's like I, the I, know, I, was, director. <laughs> I was waiting for you to say it so I could <laughs> learn how it said, and you conveniently sidestepped that, so thank <laughs> you. But uh, So let's just call him Timor. So Timor, he, he, he directed Wanted, as you mentioned, and he directed um, the Russian horror films like Night Watch and Day Watch, and they're, they're good films. And he's also the producer behind Unfriended and Unfriended Dark Web and Searching. And those three films, they're all the same style of where all the narrative, all the story takes place on a computer screen. Um, you know, when Unfriended came out, it was considered basically found footage, but it's sort of turning into its own subgenre where, you know, it's these stories that are told entirely on computer screens. And uh, they're created via this technology called Screen Life, all one word, that he, uh, this, you know, this filmmaker and producer has basically pioneered. And he has a, a lengthy interview in the, in the LA Times just about, you know, his approach to this and why he wanted to do it. And, you know, buried in that story, 
he mentions that he has, uh, you know, at least 14 films in development with this process. And up until now, these, these stories have been primarily, you know, horror and thriller based. And that's tech primarily because, you know, they spring forth from found footage and found footage is primarily horror and thriller based. But uh, in the interview, he reveals that, you know, the 14 films he's developing aren't just horror. He's including comedy and rom-coms and stuff like that, which is uh, intriguing. And I, you know, I don't want to prejudge it because, you know, I remember when the trailers for unfriended, the first one came out, I thought, boy, that looks really stupid. And then I saw the movie and it was surprisingly really good. And uh, I haven't seen searching yet, but uh, you know, our own Ben Pearson has been raving about it. So it's apparently very good. So, you know, the idea does work for horror and thrillers, um, but I, I don't know how it's going to work for other genres. I'm curious to see how it turns out. I, I feel like if you got the right person, a romantic comedy, uh, you know, set in today's, uh, you know, day of technology could could be masterful in this format. Yeah, it might. I mean, like the, the, I say in the story, like the closest thing I can think of is like if you wanted to like remake something like You've Got Mail, where it's entirely, you know, on the computer screen via email, that actually might work. And yeah, it, and, you know, like you said, it, it is really all depends on who's making the movie, who's writing the screenplay. You know, if you have a good enough script, you can really make any sort of format work. It just depends on, you know, how good that script is, really. You know, it's it's interesting because we had a couple decades of, uh, you know, found footage movies. And I feel like the pro- big problem with found footage movies is, uh, you you know, you have to give s- some kind of uh, motivation for the characters to be videotaping a moment and for a camera to be placed in a certain space and for the edits to happen. And um, it, it, you know, it's very uh, it's a very hard house of cards to deal with i think and to do right and i not that i've seen searching uh but th- this new format does allow you to you're you're now viewing the, the these bits of found footage in a way that allows you know different points of view allows uh, a an editor who is the person at the computer like you know interacting and playing the certain things like i I don't know i I do think it is very smart and clever i just don't know if uh you know it warrants 14 films isn't it like he's making the next two years 14 films yes correct yeah that that's pretty insane jacob do you have any thoughts on this I mean, I think it's a cool uh, format. I think the idea of it, of it being the future of cinema is preposterous. I think that in the same way that found footage exists as a choice that filmmakers can make as a stylistic decision, this will exist. It won't keep, keep existing. I think the Unfriended movies are good. I like the sequels better. Our own Ben Pearson loves searching to death. I think that this is a interesting uh, way to tell a story. I think that um, thinking that this is the way to tell stories is uh, misunderstanding why we go to movies. But, you know, that's just me. <laughs> um, you know what I would like to see instead of 14 films shot in this format is maybe instead, you know, pitch this to, to Amazon, Apple, or, you know, Apple would be the perfect company for this uh, as like, you know, a anthology series, like a Black Mirror anthology series where you have like 10 episodes and each episode is its own thing. But, you know, the, the underlying thing is, you know, it's all presented from a computer screen. I feel like that I would be more up for than, you know, you know, a, a wave of 14. Uh, what are we calling these computer screen movies? Screen life is what he's calling it. Well, screen life is the technology that he's using. It doesn't really, I don't think it has an official name yet, really an official name for the subgenre, like, like found footage. Like as far as I can, when I was writing this story, I was trying to find out if there is an official name and I couldn't really find anything. So yeah. I don't know if it has a real name yet. <laughs> I think for now we got to call them computer screen movies, but uh, I'm interested to hear what you guys think. Uh, you know, is there a future of computer screen movies? Uh, send us uh, your feedback to Peter at slashfilm.com, and if we get any interesting emails, we'll write, uh, we'll mention them on the air. Uh, but let's get to the mailbag. Uh, someone who did send a question in, Sean K. He wrote in. I'm not going to read the whole uh, email here. I'll have it in the show notes. But he has a question about film festivals. Him and his wife 
are, uh, love going to the movies together. And every year they try to take a vacation. Last year it was Disney. This year it was Ireland. But they had an idea to go to one of the bigger, cooler film festivals. Uh, the problem with that, though, is that I really know nothing about them. I see a lot of headlines and early reviews coming out of them, like Sundance and TIFF and South By, but I really have no clue how one goes about getting tickets to a thing like that or if you have to be working media member or anything. So I'm looking for your opinions on the best festivals that we could go to if just as fans of films. Uh, and uh, we aren't lo necessarily looking to see, uh, you know, crazy artsy films is what they say. Uh, this email goes on to say that, uh, you know, it's a very sp specific request, uh, which we'll get into later. But I think, uh, you know, let's broadly answer this because I think a, a lot of people listening out there, you know, everybody listening is probably a fan of cinema and have probably thought about, you know, maybe going to see a film festival as a film fan. Uh, I, you know, before I started writing about movies, I was living in Boston and I would go to the Boston Film Festival, uh, which was in downtown Boston. And it was one of those film festivals where you just buy tickets. Uh, you go to the screenings. Some of the screenings have Q&As. Most of them don't. Um, and uh, I later found my way into Sundance volunteering as a volunteer at Sundance. Uh, lucky enough that they would give me accommodations and I'd work, you know six hours a day and get to see as many movies as I wanted. So there, there, there's many different ways you can go about going to film festivals. And I should say up front that we attend film festivals primarily now as members of the press. So we are usually given press passes. Uh, but we do have an idea of uh, what the other side of uh, the, you know, the aisle looks like because, you know, we are in shuttles and, you know, talking to a lot of people that are at these festivals and we, we know what the prices are. So, uh, you know, let's start off with you, Jacob, because, uh, you know, you, you go to a couple of film festivals in Austin, Texas. Um, are these things that the general public can attend? Uh, yes, I attend and have attended for about a decade now, South by Southwest and Fantastic Fest. And uh, both are extremely accommodating toward uh, non-press, and the vast majority of people attending are non-press. So if, uh, if you want to go as a fan, these are really good choices. And I'll start with South by Southwest to give you an idea of what the tone of the fest is, what it's about, what the prices are. Uh, South by Southwest is uh, held in March. Uh, next year is March 8th through 17th in Austin, which is a really amazing city to visit. So if you need a vacation spot, it's great food, lots of tourist stuff, lots of great hiking in nature, lots of great drinking. And South, South by Isaac is an opportunity to really see the city in the area. And there are there's actually three festivals in one. There is the film festival, the music festival, and the interactive uh, conference. And you can buy individual badges for each of those. Uh, right now, a film badge is $825. The closer you get to the festival, it can get more and more expensive. But you can also go all in on a platinum badge, which will cost you about twelve hundred dollars now, sixteen hundred uh, closer to the festival start. And that's a lot of money. But uh, I know our uh, Sean wrote in saying he's been to Ireland in, on Disney vacations, so that's Disney money. <laughs> if you want to make the comparison, and the platinum badge um, gets you into film, interactive, and music. So if you want to spend two weeks in Austin and see movies, attend concerts, uh, go see a lot of weird technology and, and hear, hear speakers talk about all kinds of things, uh, Platinum Badge really is amazing. And if you use it every single day, that price uh, will be worth it. Um, the issue with South By is that it is a very busy festival. It is incredibly crowded with lots of lines, lots of waiting uh, lots of uh, people coming into town who aren't attending the festival just to try to um, hawk things and, and uh, sell their wares and, and pitch their movie ideas. So it's it's definitely a, a, it's, it's chaos. It's it's a lot of chaos. And like most film festivals, you have to get in line early for the big screenings, and you may get shut out of some things. Uh, it's a matter of uh, looking around, and saying, "Okay, do I want to wait four hours in line to see this big premiere that I may get shut out of because there are celebrities in attendance, or do I want to go see smaller movies that I can guarantee to get in, um, but don't have you know." Uh, John Krasinski there on stage to, to, to introduce a quiet place. So South by is a huge experience. It's a huge event. It's expensive, but there's a whole lot of fest there. You will see a lot of things. You will experience a lot of things. And it's a good excuse to really see Austin. You, you'll be jumping from venue to venue, riding shuttles, taking ride shares. You will see the city. Um, but like I said, it is not relaxing. It is an ordeal to attend, but it is fun. 
what, what type of movies do, do you usually typically see at South by? Uh, South by tends to be a little all over the place in a good way. It's hard to, to nail down their identity. Uh, to give you an idea, they uh, tend to have like big movies uh, in the evenings. Like they had, a, a, they premiered a Quiet Place earlier this year, but they also um, premiered like Twenty One Jump Street and uh, Sausage Party. They tend to like be the festival. I feel like tends to do, like uh, like the raunchier, um, lowest common denominator stuff in a good way. Uh, it tends to be you'll you'll find you know documentaries and more artistic stuff, but. I feel like it's it's more close to Sundance in terms of programming um, that if, if any other festival I can compare it to. I think Peter will get to Sundance in a second. Very indie friendly. Uh, very um, here are new and emerging filmmakers. Here are exciting voices. So it tends to find that good balance between in the evening comes to you celebrities. In the morning, in the day, here are new voices from around the country, um, mostly around the country. Uh, the international uh, international stuff isn't as strong as other fests I've been to, but it's still good. Um, it's also, they tend to have really strong documentary programming. Their documentary programming uh, has consistently blown me away. And their midnight programming, while not as good as Fantastic Fest, which I'll get to momentarily, is still full of some really crazy, awesome late night, uh, midnight movies. And you, you mentioned Fantastic Fest. I, this is one of my favorite conventions that I've ever been to. It's often, I think, referred to as a uh, summer camp for film fanatics. Um, <laughs> it, it is. Uh, but it's the kind of films that play there are very different than the films that play at South by, right? Uh, yes. Here's the thing about Fantastic Fest. It is a genuine relaxation and a pleasure to attend. There are no lines. Their new system is you enter what you want to see uh, the night before into a computer program that um, so assigns everybody tickets and makes sure you get as much as you want. So you may not get into your number one choice every single slot, but you're, you're guaranteed to see a movie in every single slot, every single day. You, you will not be shut out of anything. You'll never wait in line. There are bars and drinks and restaurants nearby, and you just sit by, sit down with a drink in your hand, talking to people. You listen for your number. You get up. You go to the theater. You take a seat. Um, it is the easiest thing in the world. It is a, as, as press, as, um, as talking to people who are there for fun. It is just an absolute breeze. But as Peter alluded to, it is a genre film festival. It is horror movies, action movies, fantasy movies, science fiction. There is some drama and some comedy as well. But it tends to like, it tends to um, be about world cinema that's um, off the beaten path, stuff that is outrageous and strange, and probably you're never going to see anywhere else. And they are they have they have their fair share and, of big premieres. Like let's Overlord clarify there, there yeah. because like you know when you go to a festival like uh, you know Sundance or whatever, you know a lot of those movies get released somewhere, right? Yes. When you say you're never going to see anywhere else, there are movies I've seen at Fantastic Fest that I've never seen pop up on any video on demand or streaming service ever again. Yeah, there's a movie, I'll, I'll give you an idea of the kind of stuff I've seen there. There's a movie called A Boy and a Samurai, it's a Japanese movie, by a time-traveling samurai who ends up in modern-day Japan and ends up learning he's a really good pastry chef and, and ends up turning into a sweet romantic comedy, time-traveling samurai romantic comedy about this samurai entering dessert competitions uh, and, and befriending a young boy. It will never be released in the United States for, for rights reasons, and but having seen it, it was an incredible experience. I can't imagine ever forgetting that movie. Uh, but it will never play. It will never open in the United States uh, unless somebody clears up rights issues for a movie that there's no demand to see. So this is a festival full of just incredibly rare, special, weird things. Last year they had a movie made for a couple thousand bucks by um, by uh, an African filmmaker working on a shoestring budget, and it blew the audience away with how ingenu how with the ingenuity of it and, and how much fun it was. Uh, but once again, like you don't see that kind of movie released in theaters ever in the United States, not even on uh, VOD or on streaming. Oh, it's called Bad Black, by the way. And so this is this fest is really something special. It is the best run fest I've ever been to. Like I said, it, you never have to wait in a line. You're guaranteed to see a movie no matter what. It's cheaper than South by a super fan badge, which gives you first priority on screenings, is six hundred and forty dollars, and a fan badge is five hundred and twenty. Uh, I think this is also it's, and it's it's in one location it's in one theater uh, one multiplex that owned by the Allen Draft House in Austin, so you you, don't, you you park in one place you stay there and you never have to worry about traveling, or um, or getting from venue to venue. Um, I know I, I, the elephant in the room here is that there was some controversy last year where certain members of the found, founders of Fantastic Fest were accused of some inappropriate behavior. Um, I have personally never encountered that. I've spoken to many many people who never have either. Uh, but I feel I feel like that should be something that our uh, potential visitors should be aware of um, before they look into this. But 
for my money, it is the best festival I've ever attended. It, that takes place in September? Uh, yes, it um, usually late September, uh, September 20th through 27th this year. Yeah, and uh, I would say that the mother of all film festivals is considered Sundance Film Festival. It's it's the the one that kind of started the whole uh, independent movie revolution uh, in what the eighties, early nineties, um, and I've been attending it since two thousand four. First, as a volunteer, as I mentioned, there are those opportunities at all these festivals to volunteer, and maybe you'll get accommodations and be able to get to see movies. Um, you know, you'll have to do some research on that and see, you know, you know your mileage may vary uh, from fest to fest. Um, but uh, Sundance is also probably the most expensive film festival to go to. It runs 10 days in Utah, Park City, Utah. Uh, so not only uh, do you have to fly into Utah, but then you got to take, you know, a bus, a shuttle from Salt Lake all the way to uh, the small town of Park City. One of the things I like about Sundance over all the other festivals uh, is that it is so kind of uh, you f- when you're there, I like when I'm at uh, South by, I feel like I'm in Austin, Texas at a film festival. When I'm at uh, the Toronto International Film Festival, I feel like I'm at a movie theater in Toronto seeing film festival movies. When I'm at Sundance, I feel like I am secluded with a bunch of other people who are also secluded at this film festival in the small mountain town. And you really feel like you're at a film festival. You, you, uh, traditionally you buy a badge. Uh, badges can be really expensive. I think the all access, uh, badge, I, I don't even think they have like a badge for all the whole entire festival, but for the first half it's 3,500 and then the second half is 2,500. So if you want to stay from Thursday to, uh, Sunday, I think you're paying like over $6,000 and that's just for the passes alone. Uh, then also, you know, it's a small mountain town, which makes a lot of money off tourism and skiing. So to get accommodations, there are a few thousand dollars, uh, some big films break out of Sundance, some, you know, big careers. You can, you, you can do search. I, I can link to you, uh, the best films to come out of Sundance, uh, an article series that I, I do every year from Sundance and and you can see what kind of movies come out of there. But generally, you see a lot of like independent stuff, usually now starring big names that you know of, you know, in Q&As with the filmmakers and those actors after the screenings. Um, but I don't know, for a film fan, if you can't get in as a volunteer, it is very expensive. If you know someone that who, who is a Utah resident that lives near uh, Park City... Uh, tickets, individual tickets go on sale to them very early. And I think they're like 20 or 30 bucks a ticket for a screening. So if you know, if you have a relative that's in Utah that could, you know, put you up during the festival and could, uh, you know, get you to get the tickets early, that could be a cheap way to attend Sundance. But getting the badges uh, are kind of expensive. So if you're not attending as press, uh, I'm not sure I would recommend it. Uh, Chris, you are uh, you frequent the Toronto International Film Festival in Toronto, Canada. Uh, t- tell us about that one. Uh, yeah, I go to. I've been going to TIFF for about three years now. This will, I'm going back this year. Uh, I love TIFF. TIFF is great. It's obviously it's in Toronto. It's in uh, early September. Um. Like, you know, I've only attended it as press, but you can, of course, attend it, uh, you know, as a, a regular individual. Um, the tickets are, they're not what I'd call cheap. You know, they can get there, you know, it depends on the on the screening. They could be between like 18 or $40, depending on what you're seeing and when you're seeing it. But to, uh, TIFF is great. I mean, it, it's a blend of indie films and big films like this year. Uh, First Man is playing there and... Um, Halloween and the star is born, but there's also, you know, smaller films that don't even have distribution yet. And, uh, you know, what I love about TIFF is that it's literally just people, you know, who, who just spend all day watching movies. I mean, that's what all film festivals are really, but you know, you know, I, I've, I've developed this like love hate relationship with going to the movies where if you're going to a movie you know, at a regular time, you're, you're seeing it with a mix of people who, are you know who care about the movie and also people who don't really give a shit at all they're just there to see a movie and everyone at tiff they're there for 
a movie. They're there to see this specific movie, and it's just a great crowd. It's a great audience experience. Um, uh, they have you know midnight movies, which are you know horror and genre things. It's just it's it's great, and it's very doable. It's a very easy festival because almost all the theaters are within walking distance. Like I, I've never done Sundance, but you know from what I understand, you have to take shuttles from theater to theater, whereas TIFF. You can literally get out of a theater and just walk to your next screening at another theater. And Toronto is a great city. You know, it's very accessible. It's very easy to get to. Um, especially, I, I believe this person says they're from Philadelphia. Oh, oh, uh, although, I am going to interrupt you. If you are attending the Toronto International Film Festival, not as press or industry, I think those screenings are a little bit spread around Toronto. Uh, not as are, much as it's not as much of a hassle as Sundance, uh, but. Um, I mean, like, yeah. worst case scenario, you take an Uber. It's it's yeah. not like you know stuff's like hours away. You know, it, yeah, it's yeah. it's accessible. It's as it's as as accessible as you can possibly get. Yeah. And um, like I said, I believe this person says they're from Philadelphia. So if you want to go, it's very easy to get to Toronto from Philadelphia. I mean, you could fly there. You get there in about an hour, or you can even drive. Uh, I've driven before. I'm actually driving this year. It's about like an eight hour drive, which sounds like a long time, but uh, I don't know. I don't mind that. If you don't mind long drives, it's not that bad. And once you get there, it's a piece of cake. Um, the other thing is, like I said, this person says they're from Philadelphia. There's also the Philadelphia film fest, which of course is not as big as TIFF, but they, they get a lot of good stuff. They've been getting progressively better over the years and they have a lot of spillover stuff. So stuff that plays at TIFF, will play at the Philadelphia Film Festival. And you know, if they're, you're from Philadelphia, you don't have to go anywhere. And those those screenings are also very accessible in that they're all all the theaters are, are near each other and you can, you know, take a you know, take a subway or just walk. So uh you know, if if you don't want to travel far, that's a great you know option. But if this person if these people are looking for actual like a getaway, I would say tiff just because going to toronto is a lot of fun there's a lot of cool stuff to do there yeah uh and just to sum up a little bit of what we've been talking about uh you know south by is not just a film festival it's also a music festival and a tech festival so you kind of have this crazy convergence of all those kind of people and it's exciting and austin is a great town and uh you know has those big goofy comedies and horror films but also documentaries and indie films uh and you know the venues are pretty close to one of uh, one another fantastic fest uh is all in one place so you don't have to go anywhere it's kind of like you know you just get there in the morning and you stay there until you know you you're ready to go home and go to sleep uh you can actually realistically not even leave the theater you can order your food at the cinema because it's the elmo draft house and uh you know n not even leave to go to uh restaurants um and uh the, the stuff you you'll see at fantastic fest is more on the uh what, what did you call it jacob i don't remember exactly what i said but it's wild crazy you yeah. probably want to see it again <laughs> yeah T toronto film festival takes place uh, in September, right before Oscar season. So that is really the launching pad for all these Oscar movies. So if, if, if you are a person that loves going to the movies in December and January, catching up on all that Oscar movies and you want to see them before everybody else, uh, TIFF is a good festival for that. Sundance is a good film f festival to see independent movies that, uh, you know, visions that you don't normally get to see and, 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 and hopefully, Hopefully, uh, if you ride the buzz and uh, see the right films, you could catch some breakout film, uh, some filmmaker that, you know, will eventually become, you know, the director of the next Thor Ragnarok or Jurassic World or, you know, whatever. Uh, you know, it's it's a discovery festival, but it's really expensive. And uh, was that all of them? I think it was. Uh, oh. I should also mention Telluride Film Festival, which takes place in Telluride, Colorado. It's another one of those film festivals that's in a small mountain town uh, that is not easily accessible. You got to fly uh, into like Denver or whatever, and then take a, a, a bus or shuttle um, into Telluride. And uh, it, it, I think it takes place over Labor Day weekend. So I know uh, th this letter said that uh, the wife is a school teacher, gets the summer off. I think. So the summer end after Labor Day? I don't know. Am I... Does anybody know? I have no, I don't I know. Have no idea. I've, I've I, been to school in over 10 years. Yeah. So. And, <laughs> anyways, uh, but that that is a nice three or four day festival. It, it is kind of expensive, I think, for a pass. 
if you if you want to go to Telluride, it can be. Um, where, it's where it's it? really expensive. Like I've always wanted to go to Telluride, but I can't. It, it ranges justify the cost. It's it, it's it, a lot. It ranges from three hundred ninety to seven hundred eighty. Uh, but you, I don't know if you're going to go there for the three or four days and just see movies, you could end up seeing, you know, the big Oscar bait before everybody else, including Tiff, including can. Oh, we didn't even talk about can. Uh, am I the only one here who has been to the can film festival? I have never been. It's in France, which makes it very hard for me to get there. It's very hard to get there. It's really expensive. Um, and, uh, you know, I would say if you're in, interesting in, in any of these film festivals, look back at last year's, uh, you know, release of films that they had at the film festival and take a look at the offerings. Uh, can for me does not show the films that I generally connect with. I'm not going to say they're bad films. Uh, they're, they're just films for a different audience than me. Uh, I, I usually connect more to the films that are at like a festival like TIFF or Sundance or Fantastic Fest. Um, so I, I think it's, it's really about finding the, the film festival that is right for you and also finding one that can be done on a budget that you can afford. I know they said that they did some Disney vacations, but can might outdo that in price. Uh, do you guys have any additional thoughts on the, the film festival equation? Yeah, I guess my one piece of advice as somebody who's done a lot of these is don't feel the need to exhaust yourself. Uh, if you're tired, go home. Don't force yourself into like limed or screenings that uh, will just put you to sleep. Um, remember, you're here to have fun. Uh, that's the most important thing is like plan, plan your days to, you know, Maybe take a take a screening block off to go for a walk, go see a restaurant, or go see the city you're in a little bit. Uh, just I know people who who tie themselves out in the first few days and just don't have fun anymore, and, uh, and that's not the way to do a festival. A festival is about pacing yourself um, and just listening to the room, to listening to yourself, and having fun. Chris, any additional thoughts? Yeah, I would just agree with that. My first year at TIFF, I. Uh, ran myself ragged just trying to see everything and I got like just miserable because it's impossible you can't see everything but my second year I knew exactly what I was doing and it was so much better because yeah you, you know like, like Jacob said you sh you're there to enjoy yourself even if you're press you should be trying to enjoy yourself on some level I mean you're working but you shouldn't be yeah. miserable so <laughs> And in addition to the movies, you know, look at the locations of these film festivals. Uh, have you ever been to, to Toronto? Have you ever been to Austin, Texas? Have you ever been to a small ski uh, town? Uh, you know, what what would be interesting for you to explore in that off time in between movie screenings? Uh, you know, c consider that. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I would probably suggest what Chris mentioned earlier. The these people are, are in – they live in Philly. I would suggest before you go and take one of these vacations, maybe just take a couple nights and go to the Philly uh, Philly uh, Film Festival. Uh, you know, buy some tickets. I'm assuming that's a ticket. You you buy tickets there, Chris? Yeah, you can get passes, but there are tickets too. Yeah, I I, I would I would recommend checking that out first before you make your your big journey to the bigger world of film festivals. Hopefully, this helped someone out there. Uh, if you have a question like Sean K did, uh, write it into Peter at slash dot com, and uh, maybe we will enter it on the air. Uh, Jacob, where can people find more of your work online? I'm on slash film dot com every single day, and I'm on Twitter where I'm at Jacob S Hall. Chris, where can we find you? Uh, I'm also at SlashFilm.com, and I'm on Twitter at CEvangelista413. You can find me at SlashFilm on all social media. You can find all the stories we mentioned today on SlashFilm.com and linked in the show notes. This podcast, Slash Film Daily, is published every weekday. Uh, you can find it on iTunes, Google Play, Overcast, Spotify, all the popular podcast apps. Uh, again, please send us your feedback, questions, comments, concerns to Peter at SlashFilm.com, and uh, leave your name, general geographic location, in case you mention the email on the air. Please go rate and review this podcast on iTunes. Tell your friends, spread the word, and we'll see you on Monday.